Hey friends, today's video is brought to you by Raid Shadow Legends, the first game to bring you a true console level gaming experience directly to your smartphone. Raid has set the bar seriously high in terms of smartphone gaming experiences, with crisp graphics, engaging gameplay, and an epically challenging difficulty scale. The game also allows you to explore an almost infinite number of champion combinations while employing tailored tactics to take on raid bosses, dungeon runs, campaign battles, and even PvP arena matches. With hundreds of specialized artifacts to equip to a mind-boggling 600 unique champions, you can build your team, develop your champions, and raid your way to glory. Since beginning my partnership with Raid Shadow Legends, I have been enjoying a fair amount of it and some of my favorite champions have a distinctly creepy vibe to them. There's Koronar, the legendary skinwalker, who can weaken the enemy's attack and defense, Rotos of the Undead Hordes, who acts as a kind of assassin, and Gorgorav, who uses his powers of necromancy to restore my bloodthirsty kill team to full strength. And given that it's Raid's three-year anniversary, there's no better time to start grinding, because the celebratory rewards are going to be huge. The devs have even introduced a bunch of new skins for the champions, so that each one can suit your own personal style. Personally, I'm loving this gothic blood dragon style arbiter skin, which makes her look like the Bride of Dracula. Pretty creepy, right? And to help you all get started with your rating, you can click the link in the description or scan the QR code here on the screen and you'll get a free starter pack worth just under $40. That means three free champions to kickstart your game in the form of Misery Cord, Tiger Soul, and Romero, plus 10 Force XP Brews and 10 Spirit Brews, all of which will be a huge boost in the early stages of your campaign. Rewards will be available for the next 30 days to new players only. All this free content is waiting for all you loyal members of the Buttersock Cult. All you have to do is download the game, click the link in the description, and I'll see you all in the game very, very soon. I was using a shortcut to drive from 29 Palms, California to Albuquerque, New Mexico. For those who don't know, 29 Palms is located in the desolate high desert east of LA. The shortcut seemed to be only full of empty deserts as it traveled into Amboy, California. Amboy is a nearly abandoned town far below sea level, similar to Death Valley. In the land lies a dormant volcano with a lava field on one side and a salt flat on the other. But more importantly, it was also a hot spot for satanic cult activity. I was driving by myself in the afternoon before stopping in Amboy. I wanted to take a picture of the city sign because I like showing my friends that I went through the shortcut. We often dared each other to take controversial routes, and so I was dared to take the route to I-40. So I snapped a picture of the sign, got back in my car, and proceeded up to the mountain range between Amboy and I-40. Once I reached the top, I began driving north through a canyon, with high grass on both sides of the road. I couldn't see much of the land through the thickness of the grass, so I was left to just look ahead. But up ahead, I began to see something in the middle of the road. As I approach closer and closer, I press on my brakes as I see a completely abandoned red Pontiac Fiero just sitting in the middle of both lanes. Next to the sports car lay a suitcase with clothes scattered everywhere and... Worst of all, there were two bodies lying in the road next to all of this, a man and a woman. I stopped some ways back, and as I looked at the cluster up ahead, I couldn't help but feel the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Being a marine, I reached under the seat and pulled out a 9mm pistol and chamber around. The problem with the scenario up ahead is that it seemed to choreographed, if that makes sense, almost like it was staged. Could this be an ambush? I thought to myself, or am I just being too paranoid? But my neck hairs remained on edge and I could just tell something was wrong about this. Getting out of my car seemed unthinkable and almost too dangerous. It was like I was looking at a horror movie from a third perspective. I got the rare chance to witness a horror movie before me, and do I approach these people? What if they severely need help? What if they were victims of an ambush? 
I scanned the horizon and saw an area in which I could drive through. I'd need to pass the guy in the road on the left, swerve to the right of the woman, get behind the Fiero, and I'd be able to proceed down the road. I thought to myself for a second and made up my mind. I dropped it into first gear, punched it, and drove the line that I planned. I passed behind the Fiero without hitting anyone or anything in the road and continued forward a couple hundred feet. Once I cleared, I slowed down and took a moment to breathe and let my heart take a break. I look in my rearview mirror just to see that the bodies that were laying in the road had gotten to their knees as twenty or so more people emerged from the grass next to the scene. I didn't think twice as I smashed the gas pedal to the floor and didn't let up until I had to slow down for the I-40 on-ramp. I will never know what would have happened to me had I actually gotten out of the car to check the scene, or even if I stopped my car closer to them, but I think it's safe to say it wouldn't have been good. Sometimes real life can be scarier than a movie. I grew up as a foster kid, and honestly, it was terrible, much like the movies make it out to be. But one particular event happened that truly made me realize that my world is likely different from everyone else's. Back when I was 12 years old, I was sent to my fourth foster home, not because I was a troubled kid or anything, that's just how the system worked back then. This new foster home was reaching its capacity, but they were expecting these two older kids to be adopted soon. One was a 15-year-old girl and the other was a 17-year-old boy. The thing about these foster homes is that the majority of the time you always felt like you weren't wanted. You were reduced to being merely a number, another mouth to feed, another body to wash and clothe. You were a nuisance. Again, I was only 12 years old so I'm sure that the weight of being a disappointment wasn't really resonating yet, but it definitely resonated with the two older kids. It didn't help that the woman running the foster home, who we were expected to call mom, was a raging alcoholic, a loose cannon, always manipulating kids into doing what she wanted and always hitting those who didn't. So during my short time there, the older boy would make these really deranged jokes about the mom. We'd laugh at first, but then he'd just keep describing what he'd do to her, and the older girl would always have to tell him to knock it off. He'd listen, but I could tell that he could go on for hours about the sick treatment he'd give the foster mom. Finally, after one tragic night, we're all huddled in the girl's room and she flat out says, What if we just kill her? I'm sure it's a joke, but this lit something in the boy's eyes. He starts laughing really loudly, like it was the funniest joke he'd ever heard, and then just turns stone cold in the face. And just a side note, this kid was expected to be adopted soon, over everyone else. This kid was being chosen. Anyway, we all got tired, the girl kicked us out, and we went to our separate bedrooms to sleep. I think it was about 5am when I heard the screaming. I wasn't the first one to go, but I heard the other kids' doors opening, because it was a rather thinly built house, and decided I'd get up as well. We had awoken to strange sounds before, like one morning the foster mother had brought in a guest from a bar. I'll let you connect those dots. But to hear blood-curdling screaming, that was definitely a first. They ran downstairs to see the foster mom crawling against the kitchen floor, which the stairway led into. She was pantsless, and her face was covered in welts from whatever had struck her. And there was the boy, standing over top of her crawling body, just relentlessly whipping her, with his belt. I remember looking at her feet and seeing that they were bent in such an inhumane angle, meaning that he must have broken her ankles and probably wrists so that she couldn't get away. She's just screaming for help as he whips her lower back, which looked to be soaked in red. And unfortunately, we all just stood there, watching these two people. I didn't have sympathy for the foster mom. I really didn't. Granted, what the boy was doing was disturbing, but it was unfortunately not too far off from how she treated us. What he did to her before he started whipping her, I don't want to talk about. Finally, he looks at us and just gives us this look of, Hey, this is fun. You guys want to try? Like to him, it was just hitting a punching bag. 
This was not a human that was beneath him. His pupils were bloodshot and he had blood splatter all over his body. So after no one answered, he just shrugged, bent down, took a knife, and finished her. And one stab was all it took. Although I don't know where he stabbed as he was behind the kitchen's island and then he ran out the door. We had to talk to the cops and I was kind of catatonic and must have been asked over a hundred times why we didn't step in but I think they knew about her and her history and I think she had a record or something or that they were aware of how she treated the kids. All we could do was just shrug, say I don't know and that honestly seemed to be it. I was shipped to a new foster home a little less than a week later and remained as another mouth-to-feed nuisance until about 14, when thank God, I was finally adopted. I'm 24 years old, a programmer who works a lazy 9 to 5, developing websites for clients that my company picks. It's honestly the easiest money I've ever earned, and I'd almost be embarrassed about it, except I got into programming for a specific reason. You see, back in high school, specifically junior through senior year, I had volunteered with an EMT department. Maybe it was an ego boost that my fragile self wanted, I'm not too sure. Like, yeah, I wanted to walk around, acting holier than thou, and honestly, I feel like people don't want to admit that. But I will go ahead and say that for all of those months, I did feel incredible. Because of the volunteering position, I was allowed to cut school pretty much after my fourth period. Or for everyone else in the world, I was allowed to leave it around 11 a.m. with our school day starting at 7 a.m. I'd head to the school's office, sign my papers, and be dismissed. Honestly, the EMTs treated each other all like a brotherhood. It's very difficult to have a bond as strong as what they had, and it's probably because everyone was aware that you can only have so much training and fate can still decide to end a life. Impeccable timing, sharp precision, and equipment knowledge still can't stop fate from just ending someone's life directly under your hands. That brotherly love feeling comes from trauma bonding, I guess. I'll call the other volunteer kid Ronnie. Ronnie knew how to joke, but once on the scene, the mission seemed to be wired into his brain. I couldn't even make small talk with the guy while on the way to the scene, He'd just be too zoned in and not respond. So one day, we get a call about a woman with supposed stomach issues, saying her body feels weird. Immediately we're thinking it's just some sort of stomach ache because, yes, that has happened before. Imagine getting billed several thousand dollars just for us to tell you, take some Tums. Okay, bye. But that's America for you. But this, this was not the case. God, how I wish it was. During the drive there, Terry, the guy driving, said she described it as a tickling sensation. A tickling sensation? In your stomach? Hmm, sounds lovely. I ask Ronnie what he thinks, but of course get nothing. We arrive on the scene, and her son lets Ronnie and me inside. The son looked like he easily weighed 350 pounds and must have only been 14 years old. We step inside, and it's just pure filth. It smelled like really strong sour milk mixed with dog urine. There's smells that you know you'll never experience again, and every day I thank God that I don't ever have to smell that again. I cough, and the masks are on. We begin asking for information, all while hearing a woman shrieking from another room. I don't mean she was shrieking in pain. It was like she was, as Terry had said, was being tickled by something. We looked at the sun like, what? She called in and sounded fine. And all he said was, Yeah, I think whatever's happening is getting worse. Yeah, no kidding, kid. We walked into what I can only describe as the quote-unquote living room, and there she is. A woman I can only imagine must have been 700 pounds, sitting in a throne of fast food bags and cardboard pizza boxes. She was wearing a nightdress muumuu that looked like it hadn't been taken off in months. This woman was living and sleeping in that exact spot on the couch in that exact dress for... I don't really want to know how long. So we get to questioning her, wondering what the shrieking was about. It's because my tummy hurts, she says. 
I look at Ronnie and can see that as someone who takes this job as seriously as he does, he did not want to be here any longer than needed. She points to the part of her stomach and Ronnie bends down to inspect. This is based on what he told me, but he said that he swore he saw a patch of the moo vibrating. He went to move the dress out of the way before realizing that it appears glued to the grime on her skin. He gets out a thin scalpel and cuts apart where the moo was loose and works downwards to the area. He must have stared at it for about five seconds before jumping away and yelling obscenities. I jump from his reaction, and the mom starts yelling about her favorite dress being ruined or something. I raced over to see what was wrong, and lo and behold, this woman has a small quarter-sized hole in her stomach, and it's full of insects. I would say that they were probably maggots, but honestly there was so much movement going on from them squiggling around and all the blood that I can't exactly tell you what specimen was inside her. But there it was. The tickling she was feeling was because she had a small section of what I'll just describe as maggots eating away at her. And the reason she hadn't felt them living inside her the entire time was because they were merely digesting her diabetic dead fat cells. And the reason she now started feeling them? The maggots had finally punctured through to her system and had just begun eating away at her red fleshy portions. If she had waited any longer, they would have eventually led to her intestines. By this point, I'm absolutely hyperventilating, and Terry came running in with another EMT, Howard, and told him to just get out. I walked out and saw Ronnie sitting on the curb outside, combing his fingers through his hair and silently sobbing. I could hear myself. What was that? But I think I was honestly in shock. The situation eventually dawned on me and I began dry heaving into the streets. More medics showed up. The woman was taken to the hospital and supposedly struggled to recover because she wouldn't clean her surgical wounds. I believe the EMTs fought to have CPS called for the kids so I can only hope something comes from that. No one deserves to have that sort of livelihood. I was about eight years old at the time of this event. My sister and I were, to be blunt about it, trailer trash kids. I'm the one saying it, by the way. We lived in a trailer park where the majority of the trailers had their wheels removed and were resting on cinder blocks. There wasn't really much to do nor see around the park as it was just surrounded with empty fields and a small yellow wooden fence. And although the park was relatively large, very few people lived here and even fewer were social. So, with that being said, and remember, we were trailer kids, and we used to think this empty park was just some type of playground. We would break into the abandoned trailers and raid through the stuff that was left behind, or just to simply graffiti stuff. I'm not saying this was something to be proud of, but there was a strong sense of utmost freedom that came with breaking into the trailers. After a while, we had broken into the majority of the trailers, all but two or three of them, there was this one trailer that seemed to be left in pristine condition right outside the woods. Normally this meant that someone was arrested abruptly, but I don't know the actual story of why they left. But it was vacant for about two months before we decided to make our move. We chose a day where we knew that most of the park would be empty and struck midday. I prop open the window and fit my little fat self through and proceed in to unlock the door for my sister. She was a few years older than me, so... I still had the advantage of being small enough to fit into cramped areas like a trailer window. I unlock the door for her and it's game time. We do our usual scoping around the place, just figuring out what type of life the person had lived, what books they read. Would you be surprised if I told you that the majority of them only had adult magazines? And sometimes we check for food in the cupboards and shelves. As I inspect the living room, my sister wanders off to the opposite side of the trailer towards the bedroom, and within minutes, I hear what I can only describe as ear-piercing screams. She began yelling for me, her voice trembling and I could tell that she was fighting back tears. I sprinted over towards the bedroom and as I walked through the door, I'm met with just a spray of gore. Blood had been smeared against the walls, the floor, on windows, 
and over the majority of the furniture. It wasn't just like a spritz of blood either. It was an abnormal amount, with chunks of flesh and guts strewn around. On top of the mattress, in the middle of the room, lay a massive, dead stag, with a huge cavity in its abdomen. Its throat was slit, one of its legs were completely snapped off, and it looked to be that one of the antlers had tried to be cut off, but whoever did this gave up. And the worst part was that it was fresh. Not only was this place only vacant for about two months, but the smell of this dead stag hadn't even resonated in the trailer yet. You could smell the blood and the dead deer, sure, but this thing was massive. If it wasn't fresh, then you would have easily been able to smell this just by walking by the trailer. After a few seconds, my sister shoved me out of the way and booked it out of there. I don't know why, but that memory always stuck with me. She didn't push me out of the door, no, she shoved me into the room so she could get out. I always thought she was super defensive over me, but this experience made me realize that human instinct really is oftentimes just for survival. Because what if someone was in there? What if whoever had done this to the deer was still in the room waiting to strike? I eventually followed after her and raced home, but we never talked to anyone about it since. That neighborhood was so nice for a trailer park, but I'll never think of it in the same light anymore. It's no longer my childhood playground, but instead, it's a home to some deranged lunatic who brutally massacred a deer, and they only lived a few feet away from everyone else. Have you ever heard about the conservative Christian sect called the Plymouth Brethren? Don't worry, most people haven't, and to be fair, they have remained rather secretive. Similar to the Church of Scientology, the Plymouth Brethren have used defamation lawsuits to silence any criticism against themselves. One of their own, John Nelson Darby, also referred to as the father of the exclusive Brethren movement, has been credited with creating a modern rapture doctrine. The Brethren believe in very traditional views when it comes to marriage and courtship. No physical contact is allowed between men and women before marriage, and all dating is to be chaperoned at all times. Divorce is very highly frowned upon in the community. While traditional in beliefs, behind the Plymouth Brethren lies an even darker side. There are multiple murder cases that center around the group's extreme beliefs regarding divorce and the shunning of others. In 1973, Roger Paines, a British member of the Brethren, was shunned for improperly shunning another member of the sect. His punishment for doing so, doled out by the group's leader, was harsh and required that no member associate with Roger Paines. This exclusivity was even enforced by his own family. He was banned from eating with them, nor was he allowed to sleep in the same bed as his own wife. In early 1974, Paines was admitted to a hospital for a prescription drug overdose, but eventually recovered and returned home. We would say it was fortunate that he recovered, except that on the night of March 4, 1974, Paines would brutally massacre his entire family with an axe. He climbed the stairs and entered the rooms of his sleeping kids, ages 7, 6, and 4 years old, and murdered them. After doing so, he proceeded to then butcher his wife with that very axe that was used against her own children. All four bodies were later found by authorities, with Paines being the last one to be discovered. He had gone back to the stairwell and hung himself from the banister. This wouldn't be the only brutal axe murder within the Plymouth Brethren movement. In 1983, yet another quadruple homicide had rocked the small city of Bloomington, Illinois. David Hendricks was rumored to be out on a business trip when his three young children and wife were all murdered. The initial trial that followed was so chaotic and unprofessional that the case had to be moved from Bloomington to Rockford, Illinois. Despite there being vast debates about the trial, David Hendricks was still convicted for the murders of his family. He would be sentenced to four back-to-back -back life sentences and would only end up serving seven years. David would get remarried while in prison and, in 1991, was granted a new trial. And during this trial, he was acquitted to which he quickly moved out of state and went to Florida, where he divorced and remarried two additional times. After being absolved, 
No one else in the city of Bloomington was ever prosecuted, and the local police considered the case closed. David's old family lay in graves, with their murderer still running free, whether it was David or not. This happened five summers ago when I was 15 years old. At the time, I just moved to a new area with my family, being my parents and my brother. We moved into a rural town far from any major cities, and the townspeople were flooded with rednecks and farmers. So one night, I couldn't seem to stay asleep, so I went to the kitchen to get myself a glass of milk. To my surprise, my mother was awake and staring out the window of our lounge, which looked out onto our front garden and the road by our house. He's here again. He's here again. She kept repeating as she turned to face me. But the way it felt, it didn't look like she was looking at me or even acknowledging my existence. He's here for you, Martin. She said, and the problem is, my name isn't Martin. In fact, Martin was the name of my parents' firstborn son who had died before turning a year old due to health complications so it's not like she was just saying some random name. No, she was talking to her deceased baby. I walked into the room to join my mother. Keep in mind it's about 1am, so I can see what she was looking at or what she was referring to. Looking out onto the front garden, I saw nothing out of place, aside from a few long shadows from some trees. Uh, there's nobody there. I said to her, but she remained insistent that she could see someone in our garden. Eventually, I sit her down, bring her a glass of milk, and I try to go back to sleep. Over the next few months, my mother's mental health started to decline. It got to the point that her living in our house began posing a danger to not only her, but to all of us. About six months after the window incident, I was startled to hear a horrific scream mid-afternoon coming from one of the rooms. Turns out, she had drawn a bath and submerged herself in near boiling water, scalding her entire body up to her neck. After several more incidents, including my mother holding a knife to my younger brother's throat and threatening to sacrifice him to Martin, she was finally institutionalized. I was only 16 years old when this happened, but unfortunately I can only assure you that things got worse. My father refused to let either me or my brother visit my mother whilst she was locked away, saying that he didn't want her to influence us with her paranoia BS. However, this did not mean that I was not contacted by her throughout the whole ordeal. Several weeks after my mother's departure from our home, I awoke one night in a horrible cold, feeling like I was going to vomit. I walked through the dimly lit corridors in our house to the bathroom and switched on the light. I was taken aback when I looked at the mirror, as someone had written, He is here on it. At first, I thought it was written in blood due to its deep red hue, but later turned out to be lipstick. My mother's lipstick. I was barely able to make a sound before I staggered in my father's room. Stumbling over my words, I was barely capable of providing full sentences to him as I dragged his half-sleepy body across the corridor. Once we got to the bathroom, I had seen that the light was still on, but now the door was closed, with two feet casting shadows behind the door. I stood behind my father as he now slowly crept towards the bathroom. Suddenly we both felt this awful static-like feeling, which made our hairs raise and even made his alarm clock go off in his bedroom. The power in the house instantly died, with a pop noise coming from the bathroom before going dark. My father pushed the door open to find the bathroom, somehow empty. By the time I was 17, my mother had unfortunately taken her own life. She somehow had pierced her own arteries when the staff weren't looking and bled out, unable to be revived. Shortly after this happened, my father miraculously was offered a job position across the country, and so we made the decision to pack up and move. Please keep in mind that I was drinking when this happened, but... I was only a few beers deep, so I doubt it had any severe changes to my memory. At the time of this, our country had just relaxed their grasp on lockdown measures, so to my friends, 
this was a time to party. I got a call one day from them saying that they were going to throw a bonfire party that coming weekend and to come down with a 12-pack. Normally, I would come up with an excuse to bail, but at this point, I was having relationship troubles and had been locking myself away for two months. It was time I got back out there. Fast forward to that Friday night. I arrive with a pack of Modelo, and I'm greeted with what I can only describe as an uproar of cheers. Granted, I'm sure there were a few drinks in by that point, but it made me smile to hearing a whole crowd of people going, Hey, Anon's here. So glad you made it. Really warmed me up to the idea of getting out of my shell. So I set the beers down into a cooler and make my way into the circle. The bonfire was being held by a large reservoir, so there had to be at least a few dozen, if not a hundred people at this party. Everyone was grouped off doing their own thing, whether it be drugs, swimming, dancing, or at the bonfire like I was. As the party continued on, I eventually heard what sounded like Christmas bells jingling, almost like what an elf would hear on their shoes. I finally turn around to face the sound and see a girl coming out from the darkness, from the direction of an empty field. Now we had a bonfire going, sure, but it seemed like she had just stepped out of complete blackness. No one else was around her, but I just chalked that up to it being so dark. As she steps closer to the fire, the first thing I notice is how pretty she is. Like drop-dead gorgeous, a genuine fox 10 out of 10. Her hair seemed sort of messy and it looked like she was wearing pajamas. But somehow she still looked remarkable even though she looked like she had just woken up. Finally, she speaks up and asks what we're all doing. To which we kind of dumbfoundedly tell her that the lockdown's over. Lockdown? Oh, I was wondering where everyone had gone. She said. My friend offered her a seat next to me, but I couldn't really focus on her beauty anymore. How on earth did she not know about a global lockdown? Eventually, the beer does its job and I'm a lot more confident with her, cracking jokes and complimenting her. She's actually really talkative and incredibly funny, and I start to have that drunk thought of, am I in love? The night continued on and at one point, I made the worst mistake imaginable. I headbutted her. See, what happened is that I saw this flower next to her and it looked super pretty, and in my drunken stupor I thought it'd be cute to bend over and pluck the flower and give it to her. Except after I plucked it, I quickly rose back up and the back of my head collided with her chin. I shook off the echoing pain in my skull and tried to console her, as I noticed she had covered her face with her hands. I kept apologizing over and over again before taking a moment to notice that the rest of the group had drifted off into their other areas of the party, leaving her and me alone. I continued to apologize as she kept brushing it off before finally lowering her hands. I take a look at her face and, quite frankly, jump back. Her face had this pale exterior to it, almost like a porcelain doll, and I mean, honest to God, it actually did look like porcelain had a red blemish on her one cheek similar to a court jester doll and had very bright red lipstick. Her face had become bloated, although a part of me keeps saying it was because of the swelling, but it looked like only her cheeks had ballooned up. But the worst part was her eyes. What stared back at me were what appeared to be two black holes, almost hollow. I was terrified, and I was not hiding it whatsoever. She noticed my expression quickly apologized and put her hands back up to her face, but it looked like she wasn't covering her face, but rather trying to push it back into place, like it was a mask. She was this stunning beauty one minute, then some sort of doll-like creature the next. Finally, she lowers her hands and it's her face again, built with a smile. She acts like this didn't just happen and continues trying to have the conversation, but I just sat there, completely dazed and confused. After a few minutes, she gets up and tells everyone that she's leaving, and that's when I realized that only I had seen this occur. Only I had seen her literally remove and fix her face. A couple of people asked if she needed a ride home, but she declined and walked away. After noticing her walking into the field, someone suggested that we should go after her to ensure that she gets home safe, but I outright refuse. Two guys jog after her, but return after a few minutes saying she was nowhere to be found. I eventually sober up and go home, 
telling everyone I wasn't feeling too well, which I guess wasn't a lie. I was still completely shell-shocked from that experience. The next day I wake up and meet up with a few friends from the party for coffee and we get to the discussion of the girl. Except that some of the friends had brought girls from the party so when some of the guys were like, yeah man, she was really hot, the girls all stopped and looked puzzled. What hot girl? The one girl said. The field girl, the one who just kind of showed up out of nowhere. Another guy tried to explain. Again, the girls looked at each other, puzzled, before saying that they saw a man come out of the fields. Same description and everything. Messy hair, pajamas, but absolutely drop-dead stunning. He had called himself Marigold and was the hottest guy they'd ever seen. However, among the confusion of everything, I was still the only one who saw what really lay behind Marigold's face. I was the only one who had seen that porcelain-esque face. Growing up, I knew very little about my mother's side of the family. They had basically disowned her after she decided to do the unthinkable and go to medical school at a time, particularly in the deep rural south, where women could never be doctors. My relatives were simply scowling faces that wandered in and out of holiday gatherings, pausing just long enough to pass judgment and leave my dad outraged for about a week. The only one out of the hateful mob that really made an impression was my mom's older sister. This woman sent me acne medication for my birthday one year when I had started that awkward breakout phase. She once lectured me for 20 minutes about how no man would ever love me since I had inherited mom's desire to work when I got older. I was 10. I only give you this background so that you'll understand how unsettling it was when my grandmother called my mom one evening and asked her to fly down there to see them. My aunt had experienced what they called a severe psychotic break, or something along those lines, and none of the relatives knew what to do, or had the money to do it. My mother dutifully packed her things and I was somehow swept along for the ride. I was only 14 at the time and still hadn't perfected the art of saying no to my parents. The best thing about that age was that because I was awkward and mousy, people tended to ignore my existence. I got to sit in while the grandparents told my mom everything they knew about this breakdown, as my mom stressed over and over that she wasn't a psychiatrist. The list went on and on about my aunt. Her latest ex was a meth dealer. They had brewed and sampled so many dangerous chemicals together. She was addicted to diet pills. She'd become obsessed with a Ouija board. She had depression, which runs in the family, and she was always a little off, etc., etc. All they knew was that after her work had called them asking for her, they found her completely nude in her living room, curled up and talking to herself. She had covered pages and pages of notebooks with nonsensical symbols and equations about gods and demons. I think I should pause here for a moment. I understand if you think I'm setting up some wild demonic possession story. I'm not. I'm still a skeptic. I have no idea if the events following this had anything to do with the paranormal. Methamphetamine psychosis is scary enough on its own, and there were so many holes in her brain at this point, who knows what she was really thinking. However... The story is a little gruesome either way and I'm finally at a place where I feel like I can tell it. So, with few other options, my grandparents had locked my aunt up in the guest room and called my mother. Once again insisting that she was not a psychiatrist, my mom told my grandparents that they had to get my aunt sent to some kind of hospital where she could get the proper care. In the meantime, they needed the supplies to hold them over while they decided what to do. Mom called in some prescriptions and got ready to head into town. Unfortunately, the downside to being 14 is that you're old enough to be expendable. So, somehow, I was assigned the task of waiting at the house with my aunt and making sure nothing happened while they were gone. Mom promised they wouldn't be long and assured me waiting at home was better than being trapped on the hour drive into town with my grandmother. Many southerners will tell you that not all of the south has barren fields and terrifying locals, some parts have some amazing natural beauty. This is completely true, and anyone close-minded enough to bypass an entire section of the country based on stereotyping is really missing out. Unfortunately, 
this house was not located in any of those areas. This was miles of red clay, tobacco crops, pine trees, power lines, the family house, me, and my insane aunt in the back room. There was no cable, no internet, and next to no cell reception. I was stuck listening to my CD player and playing Tetris on the couch, counting the agonizing minutes until my mom came back. Because time moves so slowly out there, I can't really tell you when I was clubbed from behind. The thud was dull, but the pain exploded in the back of my skull. I used to think that cartoon characters seeing stars was just cutesy animation, but I swear to God my vision erupted into different colors as I tried to regain my senses. I didn't drop like people in the movies do, though. I was vaguely aware of someone grabbing my arms and dragging me from the sofa to a chair. I even stumbled a little in response. Unfortunately, the static wouldn't clear enough for me to stop them as my hands were tied to the arms with something thin enough to cut. It was only after my midsection had been bound and my throat was well on its way that I snapped too. I rocked my head back and forth to get away, but it was no good. What I now realized was brown twine was roped around my neck to keep me upright. I can't look at the stuff anymore without itching. Her work momentarily finished my aunt moved around the chair to face me. She'd never been an attractive woman, but at that point, she looked like a literal demon. The meth had left her with open sores, some of which she had scratched in ragged, weeping holes. Her arms were covered in blackening holes, all oozing this type of rot. When she grinned, I got a good look at the infamous meth mouth. I can't even describe the smell. That wasn't just from her wounds, either. She had caked feces all over her legs, up to the scratches around her sagging breasts. But the worst part was the strange glint in her eyes. There was someone home up there, but it was more feral than person. When my eyes locked on hers, she grabbed a bit of her short blonde hair and tugged hard enough for her eyebrows to raise. You see this? They say I can take your hair for myself. Panic was finally starting to register as I realized just what was happening to me. Too tiny to be much of a fighter, I mostly just started hyperventilating and staring. I remember realizing that I couldn't remember the word for what Native Americans used to do to their war victims, but it was definitely about to happen to me. I started squeaking a little and trying to yell out as she disappeared into the kitchen for a moment and reappeared with a knife. Thankfully, she just grabbed a clump of my long brown hair and started trying to saw off inches from my head. It still hurt enough for me to finally cry out over it. Likely unsatisfied with the results thanks to a dull knife and thick hair, her attention turned back to my face. That's nothing. She hissed. From behind my back, she produced a hammer, probably what she had hit me with in the first place. The next swing brought it down on my left index finger. The fingernail cracked from the strength of the blow. My sobbing only made my aunt laugh harder and she tossed aside her tangles of hacked-off hair in favor of digging out the nail pieces and ripping them away one by one. The pain was so bad I nearly threw up. The process repeated for the middle finger and my thumb, though for some reason the thumb took three swings to crack thanks to the odd angle it was at. I vaguely noticed through the pain that as she yanked the left bit of nail from the bed, her head was tilted slightly and her mouth was hanging open. She was listening to something. She finally stopped picking at my fingernails and leaned over to take my index into her mouth to suck on. My mind started desperately pulling itself together, and I had to get out of there. There was no way out. No matter how much I screamed, no one was around for miles. I had to survive long enough for my mother to get home. What if this lunatic killed my mother? Somehow I choked out some version of, why are you doing this? My aunt looked up from where she was sucking and narrowed her eyes, as if indignant that I had interrupted her. She sat up and proceeded to spit some of the blood she'd been drinking into my face. They chose you, and I hate you. At this point, she started ranting. I wish I could reproduce exactly what was said, but the details are blurred half because the memory was so diligently repressed for so long and half because none of it made any sense at all. 
It was something about a dark lord and people in the walls, but there was also talk of the government and radio waves. What I do recall is that she paused and leaned in so close that our noses were nearly touching. The smell of the breath was so horrible I could taste it in my mouth. I know, she whispered. You can smell my brain rotting. But let me tell you, it's not joking. He wants your skin. They all want you. Her tongue stretched out of her mouth and wormed itself over the lower half of my face. I started sobbing and gagging at this point. She tried to get her tongue into my mouth, but I spat at her, which enraged her. She screamed at me to be quiet and swung the hammer at my mouth. One of my front teeth hit the floor and the others weren't in much better shape. The memory now goes fuzzy, mostly a blur of pain and fear. I was completely sure I was going to die an agonizing death and the blood loss now occurring didn't do anything for my thinking. I was aware of her shuffling away. I know she returned. My next clear memory is of her using a marker on the old floor to reproduce what I recognized as a Ouija board. Only half of the letters were actually letters. The rest were twisted symbols that must have made sense in her adult mind, but the standard hello and goodbye were obvious enough for the connection to be made in my head. My aunt took great care in creating this, focusing like a preschooler with some sort of demonic macaroni craft. The whole time she muttered to herself, but I never caught a clear sentence out of it. Using a glass coaster as a planchette, she set to work summoning something. By this point, I was silent, save the sucking of air in through the narrow gap in my mouth. The room had gone completely still. Nothing happened for several moments. The atmosphere was suffocating as every nerve in my body stood on edge. Without warning, the coaster slid to its first destination, making a screech as the wood scraped over the glass. I couldn't keep track of what it was spelling out, and the nonsense symbols made it all the more difficult but my aunt watched closely and nodded sagely every so often. I tried to figure out if it was just my imagination that made it look like the coaster was moving without prodding from her fingertips. The dying afternoon had lowered the temperature considerably, even in the southern early autumn, and shock was beginning to make me tremble. Each shake shot bolts of pain in from my fingers, teeth, and head, but I couldn't take my eyes off the scene before me. I remember thinking to myself, Maybe they'll tell her to let me go. A loud crash from the kitchen made me jump, crunching bits of tooth between my molars in the process and caused my aunt to pause. She raced into the other room, yelled something giddily, and returned to stalk towards me with feverish delight. There was a sign. Th th this is it. He'll be so happy. She grabbed my breast and twisted it sharply. You want this, don't you? This... This! She scrambled to pick up the knife once more and eyed the pale flesh on my bare thigh. I'd been wearing shorts. Humming random notes, she began to carve the same symbol into my thigh. At one point, she carefully sliced up and peeled back a circle of my skin. Then she placed it on her nose and grinned at me. Boo! <laughs> she giggled. You just loved that when you were little. I firmly believe that shock and blood loss, as well as the concussion I no doubt had, were the cause of what I began to see next. While she carved into my leg, I stared at the far corner of the room. I was convinced I saw a shadow gathering there. In reality, it was probably just the setting sun chasing away light, but I was so certain that the darkness was taking shape. I'd never experienced sleep paralysis, but the feeling I had was almost exactly the same. Something was watching us. Something evil. It wanted to revel in my torture. The sheer madness of the entire situation convinced me that this was the one my aunt had been babbling about. If there was in fact a creature that wanted my flesh, it was definitely descending upon us. I screamed my throat ragged. I continued to try to get her off, but the wiggling only dug her knife deeper into me. If you stay still, I'll be careful. Very careful, she sang. My eyes locked on the shadow and I began to plead. I begged her to let me go. I begged her to remember that I was her niece. I promised her I'd let her run free. 
I said that I'd never tell my mom who had done this. I told her I'd let her have anything she wanted and if she would just please stop this. In response, she put her finger to my lips and shushed me. Do you hear that? She froze and I held my breath. I strained my ears. Honestly, there could have been nothing but the blood rushing to my head, but my poor brain translated this into faint whispers. My aunt grinned at me. They come. They... They want you. And he will take it? Yes. Yes, he will. Yes, he'll take what he wants. She said this was the sort of reverence that chilled me. She used her legs to force mine apart and pointed the tip of the knife at my crotch. I'll slice you wide enough for them to crawl inside. I'll stuff them into you, all inside. She giggled, although her eyes became suddenly pained. She moved her face in close and clawed one of the sores on her cheeks. I, I can feel them crawling out of me, she moaned. She held up one of her arms and shoved the abscess into my sight. Can you see them? Can you? You weren't even looking. In her rage, she shoved the abscess into my face, smearing pus and dead flesh into my eyes. It was vile enough to make me up and renew my struggling to break free. Why was it so cold? Why did I hear those whispers? My aunt was wailing and clawing at her arm, momentarily taken by the need to dig out whatever was killing her skin. I desperately railed against the bonds enough to make the chair jump. Ceasing this momentum, I rocked from side to side enough to tip over to my right. Unfortunately, my neck had been tied to something else behind me. I was stuck trying to position my legs to keep the chair from sliding further and strangling me. This broke my aunt out of her lapse in attention. With a snarl, she kicked at my leg and the jerk left me gasping for air. My vision was beginning to blur. My gaze moved past my aunt and onto the shadow now. In the darkness, it had begun to spread out of the corner like an ink drop. There were faces, I'm sure of it. Faces in the thing that was coming to claim me. I was mesmerized as my eyes tried to focus on the shifting form. I forced my burning, bleeding leg to keep me propped up, but the darkness was becoming deeper and moving closer. It would take me. It would seep out my soul through all the cuts and bruises in my body. This sounds slightly profound now, but at the time, all these thoughts were occurring instantly together as I gave way to pure panic. My heartbeat pounded a thundering cadence in my ears as they seeped towards me. I didn't even hear my aunt slip away before the scream hit my ears and the lights flooded the room. Again at this point, my memory dolls. My mother rushed in and found me in that state. She raced me to the hospital with my grandparents while calling the police. While I was recovering overnight, the small force of local cops searched the fields and forests for my aunt. Bulletins were put out. A deputy even went door to door down the single road by the house and warned the neighbors to stay inside and lock their doors. What I found more disturbing was the fact that my aunt had been tied down to the bed and locked in that room. The officers said that the ties looked like they had been chewed and ripped off, but the door wasn't forced open. My grandparents... Even my mother swore that it had been locked before they left. They had double-checked it, and no one left her out. They did find my aunt. She had hung herself with twine in a barn not far from our land. Though the nails don't grow on my left index and middle finger and thumb, thousands of dollars were able to correct my smile, and my legs healed surprisingly well. Not to be overly spooky or dramatic, but I can't lie to you. I still have nightmares. In them I wake up tied down somewhere with my aunt whispering over me. The markings on my legs sting like they were fresh. She looks exactly like she did that day, down to my blood on her lips. The only thing is, she's just one of the faces in that monster. There was a Weeaboo girl that we all knew as Jay. Jay was overweight, but more to the point, had emotional problems. Mental problems. 
I knew her throughout school as an outcast, even to our outcast group of anime fans and the like. She would always wear pigtails, and when she sat or leaned back, you could see the fat folds on the back of her neck. And when she had lice one time, you could see them trapped and dead in the said fat fold crease. In college, our group somehow became closer with her due to being in the same class and liking a few animes together. It was in college, just as the first year was ending, that I started dating T, my boyfriend. Instantly on the Facebook status update, Jay commented something strange. I believe it said, Baka, dot, 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 and that was all. Ignored it, but then she started getting nasty. At college, whenever I mentioned him, which wasn't often, she would cut me off. She flat out told me once after I got back on the phone saying, bye, love you too, to him, that I was a bitch. So we started hanging out with her less and less as a group because of how she was treating me but being nice to T. We found out on her live journal that she literally had an obsession with him because he was Japanese. He was Chinese, damn it. And that she said I didn't deserve him. I confronted her about several LJ journals that were about me and T, and telling her strange followers what a bitch I was, that I bullied her through school, and had blackmailed T into being in a relationship with me. She merely shrugged, couldn't even look me in the eye. I left her alone, but in the same lesson I had confronted her about it, she later walked past me and poured paint all over my head. I had a blue scalp for a week. It happened to be a day I was wearing brand too. Dress equals ruined. I, of course, went nuts at the time, and she got sent to the principal's office. But nothing was ever done as she claimed it to be an accident, though it clearly wasn't. She just stood behind me expressionless, saying, oops, sarcastically. From here, things only progressed. One friend in our group who we didn't particularly like anyway a male named B, liked her for some reason. Probably because he can't ever get ass and was after hers. We were going to Japan Fest, a good hour's drive away, with T driving his dad's minivan to take us all there. B turned up with J. It is, of course, awkward and horrible, and we ignore them for the drive there, mostly. T almost refuses to take her, but is polite. He's rather shy and withdrawn. We drive and get there, and there's a stall selling yukatas and other traditional Japanese clothing. T begs me to try one on, so I go into the makeshift changing room and put on an outfit. When I come back out, talking with T and joking around with Geisha hairpins and things, out of nowhere, Jay pushes me over into the mud. Japan Fest was set in a muddy field in the middle of nowhere. I get up as quickly as I can as T defends me and asks what the hell but the stall owner shouts at me and Jay for starting a fight and makes us pay for the mud-stained yukata. I'm glad I did because it's beautiful, but still, what a bitch, right? I take it off, fold it in the bag after paying for it, and carry it around, taking Jay to the side and we both ask her what the hell. Again, she just says nothing to us. T point blank says that she can f*** off and he's not driving her back at this point, B defends her a little, so he tells him the same and leaves. I go after him, ignoring B's angry shouting at how we're unfair. We have a nice time the rest of the time, and when it comes to leaving, we find B and J by our car, just waiting. She begins telling me she's sorry and that she quote-unquote didn't mean to. I snap, ask her what the hell did she mean to do, and she suddenly goes really red in the face glaring at me so angrily you would think I'd murdered her whole family. And she says, I meant to f***ing kill you like I should. We shove them away from the car and get out of there quickly. Who knows how they got home. Things like this kept happening through the months before the big violent scene happened. A few of the worst incidents. Finding my tires slashed in the student car park. Found a journal of fanfiction that heavily described decapitating me and grinding my body parts up to put down the drains. Found a pair of scissors in my locker with a red ribbon tied around them. Just plain weird, I still don't know what they meant. The final scene comes up when we are invited to a party 
for the anime society. T is like life partners with the leader of the society, and we got there early to help set it up. L, T's best friend, actually says to us that both J and B are coming to this event, just as a heads up, and gets on with decorating the hall that they rented out. We ponder about going home, but don't, and the night goes better than expected. We see them, but we ignore each other. Then the after party at L's house. T left me quite a bit to dance on tables and generally be friendly with L. They're just best friends, but you know what guy friends are like, especially when drunk. I was sat outside on the porch drinking with my girlfriends when somebody comes out and says Jay is looking for me. I sigh, don't go in. Ten minutes or so later, Jay comes out, hands behind back, and asks me to stand up and to face her. When I don't, she says she wants to talk things out, so I get up, put my drink round, and turn around to see what she has to say. We do actually talk for a while. I try to understand why she hates me so much. She states things like, You're the pretty Lolita girl I want to be. You have the Asian boyfriend, the cute dresses, and the perfect figure. One friend goes inside being called, and then something happens inside. Somebody falling off a table or something funny. So both my friends go inside, leaving just me and Jay. I felt a little nervous now. Jay gets a little closer, arms still behind back, forcing me onto the step of the porch beneath her. She tells me how she knew T before me and wanted to be with him. I tell her to get over it, saying it in a harsh tone. She just tilts her head and smirks, saying something in Japanese. What? I said, you should just die. I roll my eyes and walk past her. She grabs my wrist and cuts it, thinking she had slipped my veins, but she actually hadn't, luckily. I tried to scream, but I couldn't for some reason. I was too shocked. I began crying and tried to tug my arm away from her, but she was holding it, also holding me from falling back off the porch to get away from her. It was now she subtly advanced further, pulling me toward her and her huge ass knife. It was like a big butcher's knife from Elle's kitchen. She slit my throat. She did it, looked me in the eye, smiling, and then let me go. I fell off the porch only two steps. I collapsed and held my neck. Luckily, she hadn't gone through anything important, but on my neck, she did skim something that bled out. I couldn't speak now. I couldn't make a sound. Nothing but choking. She left, went back into the party like nothing happened. And later, I found out that she told a person who asked about me that I just went home. I laid there for a while thinking I would die. There and then. And I rolled onto my front, only making the bleeding worse. I knew I had to get help somehow, but I couldn't get up. I was losing blood rapidly, though she hadn't severed arteries. It was when she said to T that I went home, that he came running out. I feel sorry for him finding me. He actually came out a good ten minutes after it happened, and I was just laying in the dirt, starting to fall asleep. I was so sure I was going to die. I felt like I was dying. He held me in his arms and screamed for help, and the music stopped. People came out to help me. I remember how distraught he was. Everyone thought I was going to die or was almost dead there and then. I just remember being on my own and feeling that way on my own. It was the worst feeling. My body was in shock so I couldn't feel the pain. It was just lying there hoping somebody would find me. That was awful. I was rushed into the hospital, taken into surgery for my neck, but it was luckily not as bad as they first thought. Parents and police were called, the whole shebang, statements given from about six people, myself and T included, Jay included too. She got tried for attempt at murder on a certain degree, but the trials are still going on right now. She hasn't been charged yet. She is, however, in jail without bail. It's affected me so terribly. I have real abandonment issues now. Panic attacks, anxiety disorder in therapy to recover and still recovering from my wounds, although this happened months ago. My wrist is still healing, constantly under medical tape that has to be redressed weekly, 
but it should be coming off in a week. It was just a horrible ordeal. She really was psychopathic. I actually forgot to mention that before this, she broke me and T up for a week, spreading this rumor, emailing me from a made-up email, pretending to be a girl I knew at college, saying that they had a one-night stand together. And I believed it until I asked the said girl and realized it was Jay. Me and T are together and strong. He's actually moved in with me to help me recover, as I sleep better when he's over. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And if you've got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about all the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember... Ah, flack.